Tonight I'm going to conclude our series in Colossians. And uh, we touched on something in Colossians that uh, I want to expand on this morning. In Colossians 3, verses 18 and 19, he told the church in Colossae, speaking to the ladies, if you remember this, I had all the ladies stand for this, but I won't do that today. But he says, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Then to the men, he said, husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. I want you to go to Ephesians chapter 5. Paul said to the church in Ephesus the same thing, but he enlarged on it a little bit. So I want to look at this section, which gives us an illustration of what the Christian home ought to be like. Marriage is instituted of God. It was meant to be delightful. Do you have a magnificent marriage? Praise God. Do you have a mediocre marriage? Just testing you. Do you have a miserable marriage? Don't say anything. Just, just listen today. I'm going to help you out. Now you know as well as I do, the devil wants to destroy homes. The devil's a home wrecker. He wants to destroy marriages and homes and, and kidnap our children and he has his heaviest artillery pointed at our homes. We need to understand we've got an enemy. Someone once said that it's been proven that single people die sooner than married folks. So if you're looking for a long life and a slow death, get married. Amen. Amen. Young lady about to get married, and she's talking to her father. She said, but, Dad, I just hate to leave Mother. He said, don't let that stand in the way. Take her with you. <laughs> you know, some have rewritten the marriage vows. Now it's for better, for richer in health. I'll live you for the sake of your wealth. But if you get worse or poor or sick, I'm going to look for another chick or slick, whoever's in saying this. Now, that's worldly thinking. That's why a lot of people enter marriage. But Paul gives us an outstanding illustration here in Ephesians to show us how we can have happy homes. And he shows us the power that can accomplish this. If you want to help me and honor God's word, physically able, would you stand with me in the reading of our text this morning? Ephesians chapter 5, we're going to begin reading with verse 22. And again, he says the same thing to the church in Ephesus that he said to the church in Colossae, but then he enlarges on it a little bit. Tell you what, we ought to, we ought to include verse 18 where it says, be filled with the Spirit. We need that in our homes too. Be filled with the Spirit. 21, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Verse 22, wives, here again, submit yourselves to your own husbands as unto the Lord. For as the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he's the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, 
but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Here's a perfect illustration in the relationship of Christ and his church and how the Christian marriage is to function. What Christ is to the church, fellas, the man is to be to his wife. What the church is to Christ, the wife is to be to her husband. So let's look at the Christian home and marriage with this in mind this morning. Gentlemen, I want to start with you first. You're to be the leader, so we're going to lead with you. Now, you've got the toughest job. You've got the Christ-like role in a marriage. You are to be to your wife what Christ is to his church. You are to give to your wife what Jesus gives to his church. That involves three major things. Leadership, love, and loyalty. So, men, think about the Christ-like role of the husband and first of all, husbands are to be leaders. You're to lead in the home. You're the head of the home as Christ is the head of the church. Now, how is Christ the head of the church? We know he is Lord and Master. But you know, Jesus is not the dictator of the church. He does not force us to obey him, does he? He reveals his will to us. And he wants us to obey him and follow him, but he doesn't make us do anything. In like manner, the husband does not force his wife to do anything. He simply provides the kind of leadership that she will follow. Now, men, this is not saying that you are to be a little dictator in your home and that you crack the whip and use the billy club on your wife and children. That's not what this is saying at all. Any man who acts like a dictator in the home is looking for trouble. And that home is just going to crumble. You don't use this as a billy club to beat people with. This is the sword of the Spirit. We use it surgically. So man, think about what it means to be the head of the home, the leader in your home. Marriage rights, are, they're a lot like traffic rights. Suppose you come to an intersection and you have the right of way, but you see another car coming who's not slowing down. But you've got the right of way. So what do you do? You just plow into him, right? You're in the right. You've got the right of way. No, you watch out for the other guy, don't you? You better slow down on these intersections around here. Reminds me of a couple who were riding along, and they were coming to a crosswalk, and there was a pedestrian walking across, and, and she said, Honey, give him the right-of-way. And he plowed right into him. She said, What are you doing? He said, I'm just doing what you said. Get him right away. It helps to have good hearing. Amen. Reminds me of a tombstone. Had this inscription, Here lies the body of Benjamin May. He died defending the right of way. He was right, dead right as he sped along, but just as dead as if he were wrong. So there's things you need to understand. You can't force people to follow your leadership. But if you will provide wise godly leadership, then that makes a big difference. Men, you owe it to your families to give them good, godly leadership. And I'll remind you, one day you're going to stand before the Lord and give an account just how well you led your home. I think many homes are wrong because of wrong leadership. We're not following the scriptures. Either the man is not leading properly or he's forfeited that row to his wife. And she has to take the lead. I think the great problem in America today, it's not feminist, rebellious wives as much as it is slack, weak men. 
We need men to stand up and provide good godly leaders. We need men like Abraham. You know what God said about Abraham? Write this verse down. Genesis 18, 19. Here's what God said about Abraham. He said, I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment. Now, can God say that about us men? That he knows us as he knew Abraham? What about Joshua? Don't we need men like Joshua today? Write this verse down, Joshua 24, 15. Joshua here says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's providing leadership. You lead the way, and your family will often follow. So it's to be a leadership role. Secondly, guys, husbands are to be loving. We're talking about loving leadership. Amen. They can go together. Loving leadership. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loves the church. So that tells us what kind of love we are to have for our wives. Let me break it down here. First of all, it ought to be passionate love. All the ladies said, amen. Now, this is not the word for erotic love. Uh, it's not so much romance, though that can be included. This is a passionate love in being a sacrificial love. It is a giving of yourself to your mate. It is sacrificial as Christ gave himself for his church. Jesus died for his church. Men, we ought to be willing to die for our wives. If we're going to die for them, we might as well live for them. Amen? I don't say you'll die for if you won't live for them. You don't have to die physically. You can die to your own pride. You can die to your own self-interest and put your wife first in your life. Somebody said that most homes need two funerals to, to succeed. Two funerals to succeed. The man needs to die to himself. The woman needs to die to herself. And then they can come together and be one under the leadership of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, here's a key, man. If you're going to provide good leadership, you need to follow the leadership of Christ. You follow his leadership. He's your head. And then you can provide wise leadership for your, for your family and your home. I don't think a woman would resent submitting to a husband who would die for her and will sacrifice for her. That's passionate love. Secondly, it should be purifying love. You see there in verses 26 and 27 that Christ is preparing his bride for eternity. A holy, glorious bride. He is sanctifying his church. He is purifying his church one day to be with him. Now, men, we need to do that with our homes. As the leader of your home, you are to provide an example for them, and you are to sanctify your wife and your children unto God. The, listen, fellas, I know we've got a double standard here that we expect the women to be more godly and holy than the men. That men somehow are excused to do certain things that women shouldn't do. That's just the opposite. Man, I'm here to tell you, God expects us as men to be more holy and more godly than the women. Amen. Amen. How are you going to provide leadership in your home if your wife knows more Bible than you do? How are you going to provide leadership in your home if your wife is closer to God than you are? Come on. Purifying love. You be to the family what Christ is to the church. Christ is prophet, priest, and pastor. Men, you ought to be the same thing in your home. You ought to be the prophet, priest, and pastor in your home to encourage your wife and your children to be holy in all things. You set the example. 
Number three, it should be protecting love. He talks about in verse 28 that uh, men ought to love their wives as they do their own body. It says in verse 29, you, you don't hate your body, you nourish it, you cherish it, and you should do the same thing for your wife and your family. Love your wife in the same way. She's part of you. Amen? A woman was asked once to choose, if she had to choose between her husband and her son, which would she choose? She said, I'd choose my son. That husband's no relation of mine. The son's of the same blood. Isn't it? But that's faulty thinking. That husband's not a relation. He's part of you. He's part of you. The two shall be one in the sight of God. They become one flesh. Man, if you hurt your wife, you're just hurting yourself. Be good to yourself by being good to your mate. Have a protecting love for her. You know, the Bible says she's the weaker vessel. And that's talking about physically, she's the weaker vessel. That doesn't mean she's not worth much. Right? Silk is worth more than denim. But silk is fragile and delicate. Treat your wives with tenderness. Amen. Help her. Help her around the house. Don't sit there and read the paper while she's doing all the work. Ladies, amen. Help me out now. I'm coming to you here in a little bit. Help them out. Little boy was looking through the family album and he saw a picture of his mama when she was a bride. She said, Daddy, is this when mama came to work for us? Come on, ladies, help me out. Number four, it ought to be providing love. Providing love. The word cherish means to warm with body heat. Men provide for her needs. Give her the warmth and nourishment that she needs. It's important that she feels the security and safety that you provide in your home. That's very important to the ladies. Then number three, men, don't not only be leaders and be loving, but be loyal. Husbands are to be loyal. You see the priority of marriage. The man is to leave his parents and his wife takes preeminence in his life. Now, I want to say something that I've said before, and it tends to be controversial, but I believe this. I believe that the highest relationship, the highest of all human relationships on earth, is not that of child and parent. It's that of husband and wife. That is the highest priority in all human relationships. The children are going to grow up and leave home. You're stuck with that mate for the rest of your life. Amen. If you make that the right relationship, the relationship with the children will come along and be right too. There's the priority of marriage. Troubles begin, guys, when the man becomes so busy earning his salt, he forgets his sugar. Amen. Listen to me, DJ. We got some newlyweds here. We got some fixing to get married. Some of you have been at this a long time. But we always need some help, don't we? As I said, Satan is attacking the home and marriage. We need to shore up against that. There's the permanence of marriage. He shall be joined unto his wife. What God joins together, let no one put asunder. Divorce is not of God. That's man's idea. The husband is to be loyal to his wife as Christ is loyal to his church. Men, be loyal to your marriage vows. I talk to people who want to leave their mate, and they say, well, I just owe it to myself to be happy. I'm not happy. That's the way they say it, too. It's kind of pathetic. I want to tell you something. Listen to me. You don't need to be happy. 
You need to be holy. That comes first. You keep your vows that you made before God. And you, tell you what you owe, you don't owe it to yourself to be happy. You owe it to your family to be holy and provide good leadership. The two become one flesh. That's not just physical. That's spiritual and psychological. And let me say this. Sex is reserved for marriage. Alone. It's reserved. Write this verse down. Hebrews 13, 4. Here it says, Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. Premarital sex is a sin. We got a lot of people living together today without marriage. It's a sin. It's a sin against God. And God will judge it. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 with me. Let me show you what God thinks about this. 1 Corinthians chapter, it just amazes me. People who profess to be Christians and say they love the Lord and yet they will live together without any second thought about it. Here's what God says about this. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, look at verse 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Listen to this. Neither fornicators, that's people living together. That's what they're fornicating. Living together without marriage, they're fornicators. Nor idolaters, nor adulterers, those who break their wedding vows. Nor effeminate, homosexuals. Nor abusers of themselves with mankind. Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners. They shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Neither shall they inherit the kingdom of God. Now he says in verse 11 to the Corinthians, he said, such were some of you. You used to be that way, but you got saved. You got sanctified. You don't live that way anymore. God will judge this kind of sin. You say, well, we're engaged to still fornication till you get married. Listen, sex can be either delightful or dirty. It just depends on where it is. You may have a beautiful front lawn, lush and green, but if I went and took a shovel full of it and dumped it in your living room on the carpet, now it's just dirt. Out there it's a beautiful lawn, in here it's just dirt. That's the way it is. Keep it where God put it, and it'll be fine. Young people, listen to your pastor. You that are unmarried, listen to me. Save yourself for your future mate. You can be loyal to your future mate. You may not even know who it is, but they're out there. You can be loyal to that person right now and go to the altar, a virgin, and give yourself to that mate on your wedding night. I want to tell you something. You'll be glad you did. You'll be glad. To do that when that day comes. You eat your cake now, you're just going to have a crummy tomorrow. All right, ladies, are you ready? There's the church like role of the wife. Now, the men, we are to be like Christ is to the church. Women, you are to be like the church is to Christ. The relationship the church has with Christ, you fulfill the church like role. Three thoughts I want to share with you. He tells us first it's a submissive role. It is a submissive role. The wife is to follow the leadership of her husband even as the church follows the leadership of the Lord Jesus. The feminist movement rejects this. I understand that. The feminists reject the God-ordained role of the wife and mother. But I want to ask you something. Are homes better off today because of the feminists? The radical feminazis? They call marriage enslavement. 
They urge women to abandon the role of housewife and homemaker. And folks, many of the leaders in the feminist movement are ungodly, man-hating lesbians. I don't think they're going to provide good leadership. When a woman refuses to submit to God's plan, she's going to have problems. First, she's going to have a problem with God. Now, don't come and write me your hate mail after this because I'm not your problem. I'm just the messenger. If you don't like this, your problem's with God. I mean, this is what God has to say. He, he gave us this book. This is the word of God. And ladies, if you'll obey God's will, things will go much better for you. But if you rebel against it, things are going to go bad. It's going to go bad in your home. You're going to have problems with your children. If you don't respect the authority God gave you, don't be surprised if your children don't respect your authority. They learn rebellion from you. Come on. You're going to reap what you sow. If you sow rebellion in your home, you're going to reap rebellion. God gives authority to those under authority. Now, ladies, accept this as God's will and do it with the right attitude. I mean, don't go home and say to your husband, well, the pastor says you're supposed to lead this home, and bless God, you're going to start leading this home right now. Don't do that. Don't order your husband to be the head. It doesn't work that way. I heard about a well-to-do country preacher who wanted to make a survey in his community with the married couples. He took a wagon load of chickens and two mules and went from house to house looking for a home where the man was really the head of the home. If the wife was the head of the home, he gave them a chicken. If the man was the head of the home, he'd give them a mule. He was out in the farming country. Well, he'd been giving out chickens all day. And he comes to this house, and the man, man says, I'm the head of this house. I mean, there's no doubt about it. I'm the head of this house. He said, honey, who's the head of this house? She said, you are, dear. Well, the preacher said, well, then I'm going to give you one of these fine mules. Which one do you want, the white one or the brown one? He said, we'll take the brown one. She said, no, we'll take the white one. He said, but honey, she said, shut up, we're taking the white one. The man said, well, I guess we'll take the white one. The preacher said, no, you get a chicken. <laughs> Amen. Be a submissive rope. One man boasted, I'll tell you, I run things at my house. His friend said, that's true. He runs the washing machine, the dryer, the vacuum cleaner, the dishwasher. Secondly, ladies, is to be a supporting rope. The church is in a supporting rope when it comes to the work of Christ. It's the Lord's work. It's the Lord's work. But we are commissioned to serve him, to carry on that work in a supporting role. Now, ladies, the wife is to be a helpmate to her husband. She has a supporting role. And ladies, if you do this right, you'll make him a better husband. You'll make him a better father. You support him and build him up. Now, I know we're living in a day and time the the modern woman resents this idea. But ladies, God designed you. And you will never be happy unless you are fulfilling God's ordained role in your life. And I said God's ordained role. Not what man may say. One guy put a one ad in the classifieds. He said, wanted a good woman. Must be able to clean, cook, sew, dig worms, and clean fish. Must have a boat and motor. Please send picture of boat and motor. 
Lady, you don't answer ads like that. That's not what you're looking for. You young ladies, you wait until God brings the right man into your life. You pray that God will bring you a good, godly man. And you wait until he brings it. Finally, it's a sharing role. We share in the responsibilities. We share in the rewards. What does Jesus share with his church? All the riches of Christ are at our disposal by faith. He shares his wisdom. He shares his power, his authority, his inheritance. How do we share in these things? By submitting to his lordship and obeying his will. By being faithful servants, we will gain rewards. Marriage is to be a sharing relationship. This idea that I want to end my marriage, I want to be free. Free to do what? Free to do what? Hey, when, when is a train more free? When it's on the tracks or when it's off the tracks? Lady, for you to leave your husband for another man is no more right than for this church to leave Christ for another God. Meditate on that. You're only going to wind up miserable, and you're going to lose everything of true value. 1980 Harvard study revealed that when a couple attended church faithfully and prayed together and read their Bible together daily, there was only one divorce out of 1,100 when that happened. One out of 1,100. You know what's sad? Is that many Christian couples would be awkward trying to pray together and read their Bible together because it's not done. But folks, there's the key. Get into the Word of God. Pray together. Pray for one another. Pray for your children. Pray for your home. That God will bless. Otherwise, we're going to see divorce rates continue to rise. Too many church members are listening to the world and ignoring the word. Men, fulfill your Christ-like role in a marriage. Ladies, fulfill your church-like role in a marriage. Men, love your wives as Christ loves the church. Ladies, reverence your husband. Children, obey your parents. You'll have a happy home. He said that it may be well with thee. Thou mayest live long on the earth. Now, if you're not saved, do you know Christ is proposing to you today? Do you know Jesus is the heavenly bridegroom? And he is proposing to you that you accept him as your Lord and Savior, that you invite him to come into your life. And if you'll invite him, he'll come in. He'll save you. He'll forgive your sins. He's preparing a home in heaven for you, and you'll live happily ever after. But you've got to respond to his proposal. He says, I love you. I want to save you. I want to be your Lord and Savior. And that's up to you. You can either receive him or you can reject him. But what you do with Christ, one day will determine what Christ will do with you.